What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And before we get into today's conversation with Lauren Luke, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews you get, the more it helps new people find the show and it really helps to grow the community that we're developing here. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. I put out brand new interviews every single Monday and brand new takeaways episodes where I sit down solo and break down those recent podcast episode of the week. Every single Thursday is an audio exclusive. And last but not least, if you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to share it to your Instagram story. Tag myself at the Jacob Kelly, tag Lauren and at Lauren Luke underscore Panacea 81. And I'll feature you on my account and send you a message as well. And now without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Lauren Luke. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. And today, beauty YouTube is a massive industry. But did you know that this industry was pioneered by a woman from South Shields, England? In the late 2000s, Lauren Luke was the first YouTuber with her own makeup palette. Also, she had her own book, a video game, a TV show, and more. You can't talk about the history of YouTube without talking about Lauren Luke. And I could not be more excited to have her here on the podcast today. Lauren, welcome to the show. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> Thank you for having us on the show, Jacob. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to have you here. So I want to start, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. And I want to talk about where you first got into into makeup. And from my understanding, one big influence in terms of makeup in your life was your grandma, right? She used to put on makeup every day and you just kind of watch her put it on and then you taught yourself how to do it. Yeah, growing up, I still love watching my grandma put makeup on. My mom and my sisters don't wear it. I'm the, oh, I'm the only person in the family that wears it. But I used to just love watching her go from this grey, pale face to this beautiful, colourful cheekbones, eyeshadow. And she used to put this headband on so that she didn't get a hair full of makeup. And I just love watching the transformation. And I think that's where it all come from. Okay. And at that point in time, then, when you were growing up, did you know you wanted makeup to be a big part of your life? Or did more so just was something you did that you enjoyed and you had no actual plans of making it a big part of your life? Oh, I never had any plans. I think during school, I used to get picked on a lot. I wasn't, I, I didn't have any friends. I stuck out like a sore thumb. And I used to use makeup to make myself feel a little bit better about myself. And it actually worked. I ended up getting a lot of boyfriends. Girls used to say, oh, I like your makeup. And I found out I had friends through wearing makeup. So it's quite a fickle way of doing it. But I was like, oh, I like the way people are treating us. So I started to wear a lot more makeup. And I just went from there to school. Okay. And so correct me if I'm wrong, before you started selling makeup on eBay, you were a taxi dispatcher, right? Yes, I used to work in a taxi dispatch office and it it wasn't it wasn't for me. It was never fulfilling. So that's when I got onto eBay selling makeup and I just loved it. And and so at that point, this was around probably 2006, 2007. So why did you decide to start selling makeup on eBay at that time? I feel like today people buying and flipping things on eBay is a very common practice. But back then, I don't probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it was as popular a thing to do, right? Oh, no, absolutely. It wasn't as popular. In fact, I think when I started selling makeup on eBay, there wasn't that many people doing it. Um, it was really quite new. So I would have different listens to everyone else. They would take a photo of a pot, which I found quite boring. And I used to put a whole look on my eye, take a photo of my eye, and that would be my listing picture. And I'd sell a lot because of it because it was all different. I feel like a little bit of a pioneer in the makeup selling place on eBay. Absolutely. And did, where did that idea come from? Did you see, like, did anything inspire you to do that? Or were you just innovating on your own? I think I was just innovating on my own. I think when you, as a buyer myself, but what would I like to see? Right, that looks exciting. I'm going to take a photo of that, and it just it just worked. It was set as apart from everybody else. And when you quit your taxi job to to sell makeup online, did, were you making enough money with the makeup at the time, or were you kind of taking a risk when you took the jump from being a taxi dispatcher to selling makeup? Oh, I was taking a huge risk, but my heart was in it. And I think when your heart's in it, it just drives you forward. 
there wasn't much money at the start of it because it was very early days, but it just kept on going. The speed, it was brilliant. Um, I just remember going to bed and PayPal was pinging all night and and I just loved it. I loved getting the feedback on there and it, yeah, it was just in my element. I love buying and selling. That's amazing. And I read an old article about you. I think it was from 2008, 2009. And in the article, they referred to you as an accidental entrepreneur. But I completely disagree with that because just hearing that one story there where you took the risk to quit your job to make money your own way by selling and flipping makeup, like that is so entrepreneurial in its own right. I don't think it was an accident at all. And I'm curious. And so it was it was from you posting the photos of you after you applied the makeup, you take the photo, you'd post it to eBay. And then what inspired you to start doing YouTube was people asking you how you did the different looks, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. People wanted to know how I'd blended green with blue and yellow. And it's I spent ages replying to people, ask, showing how I did it or descriptions. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to actually do videos showing what I'm doing. And then I can put that video link on the actual eBay link so people can see exactly how to get the look, what products I used. So I did it through a form of selling. I didn't have a clue what I was opening up when I did. <laughs> and that first video was posted July 22nd, 2007. Take me back to that day. Do you remember filming that video? What was going through your head as you were doing it? Oh God. Yes, I do remember. And I was so nervous. In fact, I didn't even speak on the video. So it was a, it was a mute video. I think there was music over it. And there's me silently putting a smoky eye look on. Um, it, and this, I'd used the laptop um, camera quality the quality was appalling now when you put it towards today's standards it was grainy it was dark and um, there was like music in the background <laughs> and I just showed people how to do makeup and I didn't have a clue where I was going with it I just thought right that's what I'm gonna do and I put it under my eBay lessons and it just it worked great for eBay and I really wasn't checking on YouTube at the time but then all the comments started tripping in can you do this look? Can you do that look? And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> hmm. Good job I don't work at, at out the outside the house anymore because I haven't got time to do anything else. Yeah. And and uh, in the first video, the first couple of videos, I don't think you talked, right? At what point did you start talking on camera? I started talking on camera and then people started asking us to do certain looks. It's For instance, I got this request for a Leona Lewis Bleed and Love look. And it was a smoky green look. And because I had a request for it, I wanted to say thank you. So I've spoken the video. This is a user request for you. Uh, look, I hope you enjoy. I've never done this type of thing before. Here we go. E, well, it went, it just went mega crazy. I think it's got millions of views on. And it's what shot my channel to what you could call fame. It was crazy. See. Oh, wow. And I do want to talk a little bit more about that, that point in time when things really took off, but I'm curious, you end all your videos with zoom, zoom. Where did that come from? Oh, zoom, zoom is, well, it probably isn't the Sims, but you know, the Sims computer game. Yep. Um, right. Well, when they say goodbye, I, I, I think I can hear zoom, zoom. And so me and my sister, Helen used to love the Sims. And so we started saying zoom, zoom when we said bye-bye. And that's exactly where it come from. And it's stuck. And now everyone even says to me, zoom, zoom, when they send me a message. So I just, I love it. That's amazing. And what about, what about the name of your, what about the name of your channel? Correct me if I'm spelling it, if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, but Panacea 81? Yes, Panacea 81. It was actually a name, an ex-partner gave us. And it was because he said that I was a cure for all and the panacea was a cure for all. I think it's a Greek goddess. And I thought that sounded lovely. I'm going to use that on my channel. And because I didn't have um, any plans for what I was going to be doing on my channel, i.e. makeup, I didn't call it makeup related. I just called it panacea 81 and it's just, it's been perfect. Okay. And early on, you didn't know how to edit your videos, right? Like you did them all in one take? Yes, I still... I didn't know how to edit, so they were all in one take, although at the time I used to speed them up. And because I didn't know how to take the sound out, well, you can imagine how that sounded like. It sounded terrible. <laughs> People let me get away with murder when I look back. And I still don't know how to edit to this day, but I'm very good at just, at, well, I just put long videos out there and, and luckily people still want to watch. Yeah, I still need to learn. I, I have been thinking about doing a course on it. <laughs> 
That's awesome. So you mentioned the Leona Lewis videos when, when things really, really took off. Talk to me about like how fast did it go? Like from the time you hit upload, like how fast did it start gaining all these views and getting all these comments? Oh, wow. When I put the Leona, Leona Lewis video up, it was in within months. I remember I was at my mom's house and I, I got a telegraph. Never had a telegraph before. And it was um, from a magazine company asking if I'd like to do an interview. I was like, wow, OK, I'll do it. And I think it was for Best Magazine. And then I think after that, I had ITV asking for us to be on the show each week doing makeup. I had nine book pub publishing companies um, drop emails into my inbox asking to do a book with us. And then it just skyrocketed. Once that started coming ahead, CBS, so many at New York Times, it, Forbes, it just kept flooding in. I couldn't believe it. In fact, when I look back, I still can't believe what's happened. It's crazy. It's surreal. Uh, yeah. And, and correct me, was your first TV interview with NHK in Japan? Yes, I think it was. And they sent the um, camera crew to the house and it was just surreal. And um, it went out perfectly. They did, it did really well out there. They get, I've got kept all the recordings. I've got it on a CD. It was just fantastic. But again, I don't think I understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. It all happened so fast. I'm curious how... How was Jordan through it all? Your son, how was he as his mom became a celebrity overnight? Like, how did he handle everything? Well, at the time, he was very young and he didn't have a clue what was going on. I just remember we did BBC um, and maybe Natalie Cassidy's Real Britain or the Inside Out program. because I'm lucky enough to have been with the BBC twice and the film Jordan and me at the beach. And he just wasn't interested. He didn't have a clue. And he's forever apologizing, saying, hey, mom, I'm so sorry. I look so mis miserable on you. you. You got to be on the telly. <laughs> and I had a face on us. <laughs> and he's, he's so proud. He is so proud. He actually stars in some of my videos at the moment. And I tell you what, the girls like him. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And so, like, how many like if you could how many views if you can remember was like normal for you to get at that time like when at like the peak here when everything's taking off like how many views are you getting like per youtube video oh um probably 101 100,000 200,000 a lot of my older videos they've been on quite some time as well so it's hard to gather when the views came but some of them are i think one of them's on 5.6 million but today, people are getting that overnight. So it's completely changed how people are watching YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, YouTube's definitely changed a lot in the last, in the last many years. So like, take us back. Like, what was YouTube like at that point in time when you were on there? Like, who are some of the other creators in the space with you? Like, what was YouTube like during, the, during 2007, 2008? Oh, I've got a bit of a fondness, I've got to be honest. And I think whenever you look back in time, you've always got one of them. There was a few beauty channels. I think it was Ford Models, Michelle Fan, Pixie Wu came along a little bit after me, and then Candy Johnson came along a little bit after. Lisa Eldridge is now huge. And all three of them, bless them, they always say that they watched me and it inspired them to get on YouTube and share what they have, you know, what they've, what they've got. And I think that's fantastic that they always give us a shout out. And they recognized us as one of the first on there. Um, there's quite a few other channels that were on. There was a few cooking channels, but it felt very new. I think YouTube was still finding its feet at the time. And I think it was, um, was it, it was blending in with Google at the time. So Google were getting in touch and I got offered to go and meet the queen with Google. Um, obviously, YouTube, they had people that they personally put onto you to make your channel really big. And that was in the early days when they were really looking after the, the, the newer content providers. And now it's exploded. I don't know how you could ever keep your, you know, <laughs> keep an eye it all. It's just, it's, it's the rabbit holes of videos you can watch now. It's crazy. Before we keep talking about YouTube, what was it like to meet the queen? Oh, wow. When, well, <laughs> It was just absolutely crazy. I don't know whether to bow or curse. <laughs> it 
and um, I says, hello. And she says, how do you do and where do you come from? And I felt silly saying, talking in my Geordie accent, I'm from Newcastle. Because <laughs> she, she probably didn't have a clue where it was. <laughs> but I remember looking at her makeup thinking, she hasn't got much makeup on. I'd like to do her makeup. And the joke was lovely. <laughs> That's amazing. It was. And you were saying how a lot of these YouTubers credit you as being the person that inspired them. They started by watching you and then they started making makeup themselves. But I read somewhere that you didn't like to watch other beauty YouTubers, right? You kind of just focused on yourself at that time. Yeah, I think that this is the problem. I'm very, um, comparison is the thief of joy. And I'm one of these people, if I watch someone else, I'll think, oh, they're doing it great. I'm not going to bother. I'll leave it. So I deliberately don't watch other people unless it's for things that I need, like a hair tutorial or something that I can't do. I'll, I'll watch a video on it for cooking, for instance. But for beauty, I thought, no, because I know what I'm like and I'm going to get caught up in the they're doing it better than I am or you just don't need that. And I, I think I needed to keep as pure as I could and just be me. So there was no other influences going on there. And I think I've just stuck with that. Mm -hmm. And did you ever get the chance to speak with any other YouTubers at the time? Like, did you ever get the chance to meet Michelle Fawn or anyone like that? No, I've never met any of the other YouTubers. Uh, there was one girl who did have a smaller channel. She came to one of my meet and greets at one of the Sephora events, and she was called Sarah Jack. So I got to meet her, but no, I've never met any of the other ones. And I'm curious to hear your opinion as to why you think your YouTube channel worked. Why do you think it became so popular? I think it's because I'm as I'm like a girl next door. I'm, I, I, I never had friends growing up. And I think another reason I got into YouTube in a weird kind of way was I was looking for friends as well. And once I found out people were watching and they wanted to talk and think we had things in common, it was like, wow, I've got friends for the first time in my life. And, it, and I really believe that will connect. And a lot of the comments people have said is, it's like having a coffee with a friend when they watch my videos. So I think we're all getting something out of it. And that's what keeps us going. And I think that's what makes me different from a lot of the other YouTubers. They're providing a service. They're providing an actual, a, an, a well edited, a well thought out tutorial where I'm more of a, just come and have a coffee with us. Let's talk about girl stuff. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Yeah. And I've, and you've, you've always put your fans first as well. I think that's something that, that helps you grow as well and helps you connect with your audience. And I read, I read a quote somewhere in an article that says that you feel you were a product of the digital age and you feel indebted to the community that launched you. Why do you feel that way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if it hadn't been for people tuning in and watching, I wouldn't have had the amazing opportunities that I've had today. There's just no doubt about it. It's because of people who watch my videos and they're still giving. I mean, they're still creating great opportunities by tuning in and staying with us all this time because there's lots more opportunities coming my way since coming back on. So absolutely, I do. I feel indebted to them. Just without them, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't have the channel I've got. And at the time, especially at like at the height of everything, how much time were you spending every day just liking and replying to people's comments and talking to people on the internet? Oh, I don't think I slept. I think you have to have a phone in your hand. They were just coming in from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. There was just so many channels where I had to keep up. And I think it also comes with a lot of stress because I don't like to let people down. And you just cannot reply to everyone. But I used to try my best and just wind myself up if I left anyone out. It's hard. It is hard. I think, yeah, and obviously the more views you get, the more emails. I'm still getting emails now. I'm inundated and I'm not where I used to be. And I used to, now I think, how on earth did I keep up with this? <laughs> I just don't know because there's not enough hours in the day. Are there any of those positive comments or nice emails you've gotten through the years that stand out to you still today? Oh, there's a couple. I, I, I mean, I could, I'd have to see them to trigger my mind, but the one that stood out the most, there was a girl and I hope it's not a trigger for someone, but she was, she was feeling very low and suicidal and she was on YouTube one night and she was looking for things that just cheered her up, looking for friends and 
I think I'd wrote something about feeling down and needed a friend because I've opened a, I have a Facebook group for people who are feeling down and need a friend and she stumbled across me videos and then got watching the makeup. And she said that she can't thank this enough that she stumbled upon us because she felt so close to just not wanting to be your life with someone. But I made her feel like it was worth hanging on another day to see how she felt. And I, I still cry when I think of that email because it was just so touching that I could possibly help someone in that way. And that's another reason I keep doing what I do. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Even if no one watches but that one person, you stop that one person from doing that. That's... I consider a successful YouTube channel in its own right, just from that one feat. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think, yeah, it's just, like you said, even if no one else is watching, the fact you've done something like that for someone, it's just, it's invaluable. Do you remember the first time you ever got recognized in public? Oh, yes. Um, so in the town centre, I used to go for a coffee a lot at this place, at this coffee shop, and pe and some uh, someone ran over and screamed and says, can I have my photo taken with you? And I was so nervous, I said it wasn't me. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I was just so nervous. And I, and I felt so terrible afterwards. But she kept looking at us. And I thought, well, I'm never doing that again because that was horrible. I don't know where it come from. I just, I, ha I get really anxious when I'm out. And funnily enough, I was just in one of the shops just recently. In fact, three, or three days ago, and someone kept staring at us. And she turned around and she says, I absolutely love your videos. I didn't want to say anything because I was nervous, but I just wanted to say hello. I couldn't leave the shop without saying it. And I was like, oh, I'm so thank 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 you for saying hello. It was it's lovely that you thought like that. Because <laughs> I thought, why is she staring at us? You know, we're wearing masks and we look silly, but she was making us feel uncomfortable. Did you ever have to get security or anything? Like, were you ever having so many people come up and seeing you that you had to get security? No, I think if I was on the own door, but I did do a book signing at Waterstones and there was security there. Um, and at some of the Sephora events, there was a lot of people. So there was obviously security there as well. Everyone's been so lovely. And right the way through all these signings and events, I've always had this little booklet. So while I've been signing their makeup products or their books, I've had them sign mine as well. So I've got some amazing memories of the times. That's awesome. And I'm really curious about one thing. I think I saw this, my, I think it was in one of the BBC pieces that you were in. And so after you'd already had this incredible success on YouTube, you were described as one of the most popular makeup artists on the planet. Even at that point, you decided to take a night course to brush up on the basics of cosmetics. I'm curious as to why you decided to do that. Yes, I did. It was it was just after the Google. I think it was Ollie from Google. He says she's the most she was even more popular than Prince Charles on YouTube. I think he said, or the or the the royal family. Because I think I was actually ahead in subscribers, and it was just crazy. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to show people how to put makeup on, I need to make sure that I really, really know what I'm doing. It can't just be a hobby. So I went to night school and I got the certificates. Um. And I really enjoyed it, but I did feel myself thinking, I want to be more creative and the class was very basic. So I, I, I stuck it out. I got all my certificates, but I think it's just, it's a hands-on job for sure. It's creative, passion, hands-on. Was there, was there added pressure when you went back to, when you went to school to take those courses because of who you were coming into with all these followers and the success already? Was there added pressure for you in school? Um, no, I think there was more pressure from myself because I, I went into this classroom and by then, I mean, halfway through the class, it was a bit funny because the BBC wanted to film me at college and I, I, I feel like it was a little bit awkward for the tutor because I felt really bad that she wasn't getting all the attention. She's the tutor. And there's me, this person that hasn't really got a clue, the BBC behind them. So I felt really bad. And, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And I think it, it, it was a bit, I, I gave myself a lot of pressure because the rest of the class knew then who I was and what was going on. So I felt like they were watching, but they probably weren't. But I was very, yeah, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself that time. And when did you start to make money from YouTube? Was the creator program around at that time? Like, were you making money from AdSense? The creator program came out, I would say, about a, a six month to a year into it. Um, 
And as soon as it came out, they sent us an email. You, your channel is perfect. Would you like to become a subscriber? Uh, you know, a two, two pro partner where you'll be able to get AdSense. I was straight on it and I was making money within a couple of weeks. It was brilliant. Could you believe then that you were getting paid to make money or getting paid to put videos on the internet? No. I think whenever you get paid to do something you love, it's, um, you think, right, when's this going to end? It can't be real. It was just, it was a dream come true. And, and were you ever doing like, not, not including your, your own makeup line, but were brands ever coming to you, ask them to promote their products on your videos? Like, were they doing influencer marketing back then? Oh, yes. I mean, I think at the start, you've got all the, um, like your, your Ford models were on there. They do that kind of thing with the press samples. But to actually send products out to real life people, if you like, like myself, who would use them, it was very new at the time. So I had a lot of people asking, would like to sponsor your video, would like you to use this product. And I'd say, okay, send them out, but I can't promise I'm going to use them. I will only use them if I like them. Because I, at the time, people had so much faith in my opinion. I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to anybody and say this is a good product when it wasn't. I'm just not, that's not what I was about. So I turned a lot of money down. Um, and I, I do feel very good about that. I, I never wanted to sell out. And I think that's why a lot of people still to this day trust me opinion, because I always said I didn't like a product. You're going to find out even if it was given for free. I'll say sorry to the company, but I'll have to say, I'm sorry, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. So I read somewhere that you always wanted your own makeup line growing up. So this is kind of a two pronged question. Do you remember the first time you held by Lauren Luke, your own makeup line in your hands? And then do you also remember the the day before in the video you filmed on top of a roof in New York City? Yes. Um, I always wanted my own makeup line. I mean, it's a dream come true to anybody who's into makeup. When I got contacted by the company, they were in New York, um, and it all sounded fantastic. And I signed the contract, went over to New York quite a few times throughout that year, developing the makeup line. And the night before it, it launched on the website, it was just crazy. It was like a countdown. Everyone was excited, waiting for it to just burst. Um, and on that day, they sent us a photo. I was in the office busy doing the makeup and um, picking the next products. And they sent us this photo that they'd taken at Times Square. Someone had gone from the team and took, it was all lit up by Lone look on Times Square, coming to Sephora, all the makeup palettes. And I've still got that post out today. I, I keep everything because it's it's just fantastic. And I I just couldn't stop crying all day. I was just I was just blown away by it all. And I got to, I did that video on top of the roof, and I was just so happy. I couldn't believe it. I even got to open the store in the 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 first Sephora store in New York Times Square with the my makeup line. It was brilliant, brilliant opportunity. What was that experience like opening the store? I was so nervous that my stomach was gurgling. There was people, there was crowds, there was um, newscast people outside. I remember the ITV. This is, this is how funny it was. I was busy getting interviewed in New York Times Square. My mom was sat at home watching ITV news and there's me on the news <laughs> talking about where I got my and she was like, quick girls, come and have a look, your sister's on the telly, wow, and there's me, um, and I remember that newscaster at the time, she was telling everyone, will you speak quiet, because she couldn't hear what I was saying, she was really miserable, because <laughs> everyone was making such a noise, because the brand new store, and people were screaming and cheering, it was just surreal. That's awesome, and that's not the only product or thing that you put out, like I mentioned in the intro, you had your own book, TV show, DS game and I want to talk about those things so talk to me about looks by Lauren Luke you said you had I think was eight or nine publishers reach out to you to do a book deal so how talk to me about that process of writing your own book yeah so what I, I literally woke up one morning and there was nine book publishing companies in my inbox and I remember one of them stood out it was Hodder and Stoughton in London Um, I went to see them they had this perfect idea for idea for a book they're all pitching book ideas it was crazy going to all these meetings people saying this is the book we want to do with you Lauren look 
this is this is someone who never thought much about herself and he, it was just crazy. Um, and Hodder and Stoughton they had this amazing idea. I loved the layout of the book. I loved the idea of what they had planned for it um, and were hired two photographers. So I'd work alongside them day in, day out over the course of a few months to get the pictures right. And then we worked with a ghostwriter who I just thought was lovely called Susan. Um, we got really close and she would write everything I was saying. She'd type it up and she did a brilliant job. And the book turned out fantastic, so much so that Simon and Schuster in the US bought it as well. So it's in the US and then it went into Portugal. Um, so I've got three different book, uh, book covers for the UK, the US and Portuguese. And it's just, I've kept them all. It's just, I look at them and I think that it's like, it's, it's like it's someone else. <laughs> it's just my... <laughs> And then what about a Nintendo DS game? As someone who grew up playing video games myself, I think being able to see myself represented in a video game would just be absolutely crazy. So talk to me about that, having a digital version of you in a video game. Oh, it was absolutely mad. So uh, this company got in touch. We'd like to make a DS game and we want you to be the, char the, the the beauty character. So this beauty pageant, you have to make yourself look, put all your makeup on, put all your clothes on. And I was one of the judges in this game. They didn't tell me that I was going to be the most awkward judge in the game. So I had lots of emails from young girls saying, I can't get past the stage. It's because of you. <laughs> they said that's the stylus off my head. <laughs> on the nintendo ds game because it was by judge that just wouldn't let them pass to the next stage but this caricature i've still got it i think it might be on facebook and it's so spot on it actually looks like me and the game is brilliant it's so fun it's it appeals to the younger girl like the younger girls teenagers grown up but there's a couple of people now that i personally know who run out and got it and they love it and they're like wow i can't believe you're in this game it's crazy <laughs> It is a bit mad. That's awesome. And then what about your own TV show? I, can, I couldn't find the title of it. Was it um, Lauren Luke TV Makeover or Lauren Luke Make Me Up? Right. So it was a pilot. It didn't go out. It was a pilot and it was called Lauren Luke Make Me Up. And I loved it. I, oh, I was in my element shooting this. So, so the cameras followed us around. We were in Newcastle, my hometown. And we did makeovers on people in the Metro Centre. We got permission. It was brilliant day out. We did certain looks on people, showed them what makeup to use to ac to help accent their eye, actual ac ac <laughs> accentuate the eyes. Um, and it was just really good. Um, it went down really well, but I didn't ever have my own TV show. I was on this morning. I had a segment every week, and it was doing makeup with um, three people. And they would basically pick a load of products and they'd copy a certain look. And I would come in and I would say, right, I love what you've done with your eyes. And I'd have a look at the different makeup looks that they'd all perceived when they were copying from a picture. And I really enjoyed doing that. How much more comfortable did you get on camera from the beginning of filming your videos to up to this point where you shoot a TV pilot and going on TV and stuff like that? Like, do you feel like you were much more comfortable around that time as opposed to when you just started? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's natural for it, it's if you if you start off when you start off, you're very nervous because you don't know what to expect, and you can't see the audience, but they can see you, which is quite daunting. But over time, you just get comfortable when you realise it's not so bad. People enjoy it. You don't get many troll comments. I'm very lucky; I don't get many troll comments. I know a lot of people who do, but I think that might be a popularity thing. I think the more popular you get, you're going to get people who are nasty. I've been really, really lucky. The I was in 99% of my audience have been so lovely to me, so I've not had that to contend with. But that can put you off going on again when you feel like someone's there to be awful about you or to make fun of you. But you've just got to ignore it and just think, right, okay, whatever. Um, and I, I just love being on TV in the end. I'm very, very nervous in the start. I think you go through peaks where you feel you feel confident and then something will knock you back a little bit. But on the all, it is if you were looking at a graph, you would just get more and more comfortable. And 
And it got to the point where I was doing a lot of live TV. You know, you've got to get your words right and you can't misspell. You can't say the wrong thing. You can't swear at all. You've got to be very, very, very careful. And it was just, I think I was so natural at it at the time because I was doing it day in, day out, and it didn't phase us in the end. What did you, do? You, like, how different is it shooting one of your own YouTube videos versus shooting, like you mentioned, it's all live, but are there any other differences from shooting a TV show versus shooting one of your YouTube videos? Uh, yes, very much different. So, for instance, my slot on this morning ITV, it was live. So I have really had to be very careful what I said. You had to know which cameras to look to, who to talk to. Everything was planned out and you had to get it right. I did have pods. I've still kept them all. So you've got this, you know, your points to look at. When I'm doing a video at home, at the back of my mind, I know if it doesn't work and I've said something terrible, I can just not put it out. But I do like to put it as live as possible because at the end of the day, if you're doing your makeup, it's not always going to turn out perfect. It's got, you, you're going to get eyeshadow all over your face or um, put the wrong colour foundation on or get the look horrible, really. And I like to just put it out there and say, this is actually what could happen. And then if it doesn't work, you just take it off and start again. Mm -hmm. And did you, I saw somewhere you did a cross-country tour in the USA. Was that for, what was that for? I believe it was later on. It wasn't around the time of the makeup line. It was later on, wasn't it? That was for the makeup line. Oh, that was? Yeah, that was going to all the events, for all the Sephora events. So we started in Florida. Then we did um, Louisiana, Texas, Arizona. And then California and then back to New York. And it was a, it was the best time of my life. I loved, loved seeing America. In fact, I do feel like I need to move to America one day. I always wanted to be there growing up. Is there is there a fatigue with that with that road trip? You hear of creators and influencers who when they do meetups day in and day out, they almost get tired, like exhausted from meeting so many people. Did you ever experience anything like that? No, I think for me the adrenaline kept us going. I think when you're so nervous, the adrenaline just keeps you going. I did, um, the, I think the only time I got fatigued was when I come back home and it all sank in what had happened and you were trying to get your head down, get some relax before the next set. But not at the time. I think the adrenaline just keeps you going. And I'm curious, kind of jumping ahead a little bit here to 2012 is when you filmed the the PSA with Refuge, a UK-based advocacy group, and you filmed a video about covering uh, covering up scrapes and bruises. Can you kind of explain this video a little bit more and why you decided to participate in this campaign? Yeah, I was I was contacted by Refuge, and they said would love to do a campaign to raise awareness for domestic violence. And I just thought, yeah, I have to do this because I haven't been completely involved in it myself, but I did have you know, a little bit of personal experience in the past, which made us feel I could, you know, it was a little bit in my heart. I haven't explained that right, but it was very close to my heart. So when I went, when I did the campaign, this makeup artist come in, she'd make up all the bruises, um, the lips, as if it had been, the lips had been broken. And it wasn't about covering it up as in, this is what I want you to do. It was don't cover it up. But the campaign actually got people confused. And a lot of people were saying, Lauren, I can't believe you're being hit. What's happening? And I think it upset a lot of people. But it really raised awareness. I mean, that video's got millions of views. Now it went that video went viral and it really, it really pushed the point ahead that you don't have to suffer in silence. You've got to get help and that you shouldn't cover it up. And I was in the BBC documentary about you. You were talking about how you had to make all of these big decisions on your own. Was there ever anybody that like any management or anything like, were you ever seeking out help with the decisions you were making back then? I did have a management company, but they didn't exactly have my best interests at heart. Um, a lot of the PR and media came to me and I suppose I could have handled it myself, but I handed it over to them a lot of the time and give them a percentage and they didn't really bring anything to my table it was a lot of me giving it to them and because I wasn't from I didn't I didn't have a clue what was happening when I'm starting out in my bedroom that wasn't my plan of what was going to happen so I wasn't educated in business so when it did happen it was quite I was quite naive um so I didn't I didn't have 
the right advice when I should have done, to be honest. And a lot of people used to say, be careful and watch what you're doing because there's some sharks out there. And you're just bumbling along thinking, surely not, but they are, they're right out there. And I know talking about some of these things are difficult. So instead of me asking you about all of them, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take that clip from the YouTube video you put out a few months ago where you explained it all so you don't have to talk about it again. And I'll just drop it in here so people have the context of everything that happened without needing you to to re-explain and relive all of that again. Um, Thank you. No worries. It's my pleasure. Hey guys, it's just Jacob jumping in here really quickly. I just want to give you a little bit of context on what's about to happen here. And so before every single podcast, I ask all of my guests a couple questions uh, with one of them being, what is, is there anything you don't want to talk about in the podcast? Cause obviously they don't want to talk about it. Something specific. I'm going to respect that. And with Lauren's case, it was kind of, it's the negative side of her makeup deal and how she was mistreated through it all. And but she has talked about it in the past is something she's not comfortable talking about. She gets emotional, which I totally understand. So I asked her if to kind of keep the podcast, keep the story going and kind of you get the whole picture. I asked her if I could take audio from one of her videos where she explains everything and put it in the podcast so people kind of get the context and understand the whole story. And she said, absolutely, that's totally fine. So what you're about to hear is the audio from Lauren's video Q and A, juicy questions, and the real reason I left YouTube. And then we will get back into the regular interview once this section ends, once the audio from her video ends, and it'll pick up with me asking a question. So you know when we're back to the actual interview. But I just want to give you the, this quick heads up because the audio is obviously going to change a little bit, and I'm not going to be asking any questions. Um, so that's what you're about to hear. The next question. Let's have a look. So, okay, this is going to be what you just want to know, the juicy nitty gritty. And don't laugh if I cry again, because I haven't dealt with this. I haven't dealt with it at all. Okay, so Lizette Guzman on Facebook, she asks two questions. What we, what you were doing during the time you transitioned off YouTube for a few years after a major height in your fame? I remember the makeup line, the brushes, Sephora tour and US. So that was one of them. What was I doing afterwards? <sighs> right. Well, the time that I wasn't on YouTube, having a bit of a nervous breakdown, suffering massive for panic attacks and anxiety because of what happened in... It's hard to explain. I think sometimes you can put too many straws on someone's back and then they just break, and I think that's what happened to me. Um. There was lots of, I was in a contract on YouTube, uh, not on YouTube, sorry, for my makeup line in the US. Um, and I've got to be careful what I say still, because I don't want to make anyone feel sound bad, but I was badly managed. I wasn't looked after in the slightest. And if I'd known now, what, I, what if I'd known then what I know now, I would never have signed that with them, that company. Um, I was signed up for five years. And it was to make makeup with them only. I couldn't go and work with anybody else. I, had, I turned other companies down, which was horrible because they could have led to something better. But I was badly managed and I signed a contract for five years, which was very um, one-sided. I thought, I all the makeup palettes, I didn't receive any royalties. There's, I think they're still selling now. Not in Sephora. They sold in Sephora for quite some time. <laughs> And there were so many sales. I don't know what the sales were. I wasn't kept in the loop on that. But uh, they did sell. There was money made. And I never saw any royalties. I was paid £5,000 to start off with when I first signed up with them. And I th and back then, that was like, wow, really exciting. Um, and I wasn't... And what's annoying is I'd gone to see a solicitor um, on where I live um, and he quickly signed off saying yeah yeah that's a good deal because he wanted the money the payment for it because it was going to be shown on the BBC because the BBC did a documentary with me as it was all starting off um, showing how it's going and what's happening and uh, so he just wanted his fee quickly to be on the to be on the program, even though I don't think it was shown in the program. But he wanted a fee quickly, so he went, "Yeah, yeah, it's fine. You can sign it. It's a good deal." He wasn't thinking straight. I wasn't thinking straight. And I've got to be honest, 
I was very innocent and gullible back then and I didn't have a clue. I'd, nothing like that had happened to me. I was in my bedroom one minute doing makeup videos and then the next minute you've got a makeup line on offer for you. You're gonna go for it, aren't you? Um I just wish I wish I'd wish I'd knew. I wish I'd knew because I would have never have signed it. I spent a lot of my time up until that point having fun in my bedroom, doing my makeup videos for you. Um I was regular, regular content. I was happy. I was just in the element, having fun with makeup. And then I've got to be honest, I, were, I loved going to New York. Don't get us wrong. I loved the whole feel of it. They did do a lot for us in the sense of getting us on TV, uh, in a lot of press and stuff like that. But I have to be honest, a lot of the deals that come my way, that actually come to my inbox, and if I'd known how to deal with them correctly back then, I could have made a lot more money and been a lot more comfortable and not not have been taken for a ride. Um, it's hard. It's hard to say, but it's it's. I think sometimes you want to believe in someone that they've got your back, and I don't. And and I learned the hard way, and it all contributed to me having massive anxiety. Um, I was so upset with what had happened and learning that things weren't going to be changed. I'd signed my name away for five years, and that was pretty much my shelf life on YouTube. Um, so I'd signed my name away. The, I realised there's nothing going to be happening with the makeup palettes. It was dead. I'd, I was so upset. I couldn't even think straight. I had massive anxiety. I wasn't feeling well, probably because of the stress of it all. I just didn't understand what was going on back then. Um, and I spent a whole year practically in fact it was two years I'd gone back and forth to New York so many times I never got paid to do all that I could have been here doing videos um, so it took a lot of time away from what was really important which is this is the biggest regret I've got you, 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 you're going off on this belief that everything's brilliant when it's not but anyway um, I ended up fighting to get my name back so I could make me makeup brushes the fine letters have my name for me makeup brushes and I went and got them made and they were an absolute success. Um, they sold out really well. However, at this point, I was in a lot of debt. I had to, had to hand the keys over for me home. I lost me home. I had to hand it over and go and rent. That was hard. That was really, 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 really hard. I felt like a massive failure at the Jordan. <laughs> Because I wanted to feel like I was important and special for him. And that was really hard. So I had to hand my keys over and say, I can't cope. I can't keep the house up. I went into rental. Um, and, I, and I had the dogs at the time as well. That was another question. People wanted to know about the dogs. Because I had lots of Pomeranians. And I used to love, absolutely love. Having the puppies running around, it kept me happy. Just loved it. But then what happens is you have to rehome them. And that was hard because you come across some horrible, horrible people out there who lie to you and tell you all sorts just to get your puppy. You don't think this, but they do. So. And then I had a lot, well, I had a couple of dogs die and it's, it knocked her sideways. It added to me stress. It was awful. I had a lot of heartbreak. Still can feel it in here, and I don't like talking about it at all because it hurts too much. Um, so I keep that to myself, and I don't talk about it, and I don't think about it. I literally just bury it because it's hard. Um, I've got two girls left. Um, I had to rehome a lot of them because me and my ex-partner split up, and... Got myself a lovely little house here. This is the best home I've ever lived in because it represents like a new beginning. Um, and I've got the two girls, Cagney and Mia. They're gorgeous. Um, and they'll stay here with us. But I don't want any more because they're just too much heartache. I'm going to get off the awful stuff now because it's, it's upsetting. But, um, yeah. So someone asks, will I ever bring the bushes back? I would absolutely love to, but they cost a lot of money to get made. They cost a hell of a lot of money. And at the time I had that money to be able to do so. I don't now. 
so I don't know. I'll never say never, but I really don't know. I'd love to be able to. I'd love to be able to be in control of my own makeup line. Actually be in control, because I wasn't in complete control. And that was awful when someone's, you're creative and it's taken away from you. But there was a, there was a lot going on. Like I said, I can't, can't go into it too much. But uh, yeah, the, I, I got hurt. I got burned pretty badly. Um, and that's why I didn't come back on YouTube much. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't face it. Every time I did a video, I felt horrible anxiety, sick, shaky. It was horrible. I still get like that sometimes now, actually, because it's like throwback. Like a, it's just like a, I don't know what it is. It's like a trigger of, it's not, it's not good. But at the same time, I absolutely love doing what I'm doing, and I'm in a happier place. And I've got all this makeup, and I look at it, and I get so excited, and I want to go like the old days, and. So yeah, that might sound a bit silly, but I love I love makeup. I love being creative and so I find it easier now. But there was a time where I just couldn't face it. I've got to be honest, I couldn't face coming on here because it just reminded us of everything that was going wrong and I couldn't tell anyone about it. And a lot of you had said, Lauren, you're not yourself. I know there's something wrong. Can you tell what? And I couldn't tell you. Um, That contract lapsed a long time ago now. But I just feel like, well, what was the point? Because the, it it got to the point where it um it stole a good proportion of the the fame, if you like, on there now. So yeah, what's the point in having your ma your name back for makeup when you're not getting the views that you used to get? And it it's all it all hurts. But there's nothing I can do about it. Um, yeah, there's nothing I can do about it. So. I just try not to think about it. I bury it. But you've got to get on with things, haven't you? So anyway, the second... Com cause is, I'm going to leave the other question from Lizette. Not being horrible, but I need to answer some other girls. And if I get... Oh, yeah. Right, hang on. We've got this one here. Mike, Lena, Gok... I'm really sorry if I haven't, if I haven't said your name right. I feel terrible. My question is how to believe in yourself again and make that you love if no one supports you. Do you know what? It's a perfect question for this video because you have to believe in yourself because no one else is going to. And, well, people do, but you're the only one that can make things happen. You've got to... If you've got something that you're passionate about and you love doing, you've got to run with it and you've got to let nobody get in your way because you'll only resent and regret. I know this. Um, and I find that if you enjoy doing something and you're passionate about something, the belief's already there. You've already won. So just run with it and stick with what your heart tells you. Um, yeah, I would say that. Do I think I'll ever have a makeup career again on YouTube? And that was Lauren Brown. Honestly, not a career, but I think I'll always be on YouTube because I love, love, I love that we've got this bond, even though I don't know you or see you. And like I said at the start of my video, I can't thank you enough for still being here because there's been so many times where I haven't been here. And if you come into my channel and, oh, she hasn't uploaded, she hasn't uploaded, you're just going to get disheartened and go, and I wouldn't blame you. And the fact is I've stayed, I kind of, I really love that about YouTube and yeah and you've made us feel so welcome and I've got a channel here and I'll probably always be here but I don't know if it'll ever be big again I think that time's gone you just gotta roll with whatever you get given don't you so you took the hiatus in around 2014 what are some things that you did during that time like was it do you remember the first day where you officially decided I'm taking a break from YouTube do you remember that first day was there like pressure and like the weight had been lifted off of your shoulders like do you remember that i remember actually sitting down to film a video and having a panic attack and i think and this this isn't right maybe this is just a fluke i'll do it again so i filmed another video the day after and i had another panic attack the anxiety was just too much it's something i've never experienced before either i didn't know what was going on at the time but looking back i do now know that i was suffering with anxiety through all of everything and I think also because everything had happened so fast and I wasn't looked after properly 
it did leave us in a little bit of a nervous state. Um, I don't like the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder because I didn't go to war. I didn't say anything horrific. And I feel like I don't deserve to say that, but I do feel a little bit like what happened left us with, with a nervous disposition. And I definitely suffered with a lot of anxiety around doing the videos. So every time I tried to go on, it just wasn't working. And I thought I need to come away from here for now and take things a bit more simple. I went and got an ordinary job, which was hard for us because I felt people are going to recognize me and they're going to wonder what's happening. And they did. I used to get asked when I was at work, are you the girl off the internet? Are you still doing your makeup videos? I love your videos. People were never horrible. They were always lovely. I did get recognized a lot. And I used to feel a bit, ah, oh, I'm in an everyday job. What will they be thinking? Especially from what I used to do. They'll be thinking, you know, because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed that I wasn't on there anymore and I was taking a break. But you've got to just do what you've got to do. And then... I'm so glad I came back on because I feel in a lot in a better position now. Mm -hmm. And when did you decide to come back on? I believe it was 2018, right? Yes, I, st I came back on in 2018. I did a few videos, but not a lot, mostly because work restricts the time and I've got. But every time I put a video out, people were like, oh, I'm so glad to hear you back. And I we we'll want to hear more. We we'll want you back. But we'll understand and we'll be patient. And it was like, oh, this is so lovely. And and it's just bit by bit putting videos back out there and then the views are coming back up. People are saying, I'm so glad you're posting again. People from years ago who'd completely lost my channel, they're finding us again and they're like, oh, because they grew up with us. And so it's just, I mean, I mean I'm in a really good place with YouTube at the moment. It's fantastic. That's good. And when, when you, when you started filming videos again, was it, was it like an adjustment to get back to filming videos or was it kind of like riding a bike? Were you able to pick it up super easily? Well, it's funny. It was like riding a bike, but saying that in front of the camera, talking, yapping away, not, nothing's a bother, but putting makeup on, I'm rusty. It took me ages to think, yeah, I can't remember which technique I used. And then you think, right, okay. So I'm going to have a look on YouTube to see what people are doing, which I never used to do. And then you think, ah, they're all streets ahead with the makeup applications. It's completely different to how it used to be. So, right, we've got to relearn, do different techniques. And it, yeah, it's just completely crazy. I've got so much to learn. And it is, it's like a whole new world. It's really exciting about what's next. That's good. And I'm, and I'm curious. So... Do you, you said how the numbers are slowly starting to pick up again, which is amazing. But when you first came back and you started posting videos again after about a four year break, other than those couple update videos in between, was it hard for you to not be getting the same amount of views as you were before? It was hard, but at the same time, I understood it's you can't expect people to be waiting for you. And I'm just very grateful that they did actually wait for me. And there was still quite a lot of views. Never what it was going to be. And YouTube's moved on so much now anyway that the so I mean, the makeup part on there is saturated. I used to be one of, say, 20. Now it's thousands. Everyone's on there doing makeup. So I'm not going to stand out. And especially since I don't filter or have special editing effects, it's just me yapping away. And I've, I've still got my core audience and I'm over the moon with that because that's manageable to me and I feel like I know them all as well when I see their comment I think I can put names to them I know who they are and they're like a got a little friendship going it is brilliant mm -hmm. and do you think you're ever going to start doing other non-makeup type videos I know in one of your updates I think it was in 2018 you said you're maybe thinking about doing cooking videos or something like that do you think you're ever going to expand into other types of videos yes well Martin's doing his cooking videos now he's getting right into that so we posted his first salmon and pak choy video last night. He was, we loved it, editing in the kitchen. And I do a lot of art, a lot of um, acrylics on canvas, oil painting, um, pastel painting, and I love putting them on there. And although they don't do as well as the makeup videos, it, it's a different audience and it's another little vehicle and people can watch along if they like what I do on there to start with. Mm -hmm. And how, how, does, how did Martin handle the dating an internet celebrity like how does he handle being in front of the camera does he enjoy that whole process talk to me about that martin doesn't like to be in front of the camera too much 
I remember when he said, "But well, you've got to get back on there. You're going to love it." And he's always so helpful and cheering. And he came and done a video with us once, and it was we doing his makeup. Well, we never stopped laughing the whole way through. We just couldn't catch our breath laughing. So I did him up as Jeffrey Star, and we bought this bright pink wig for him. And I couldn't put it on his head for laughing. It was so funny. But people loved it. And, and then we did another one with a dark wig. And he was doing a conference call. It was all by the furlough season for work. And they did a lot of um, calls to see how everyone was getting on. And Martin had put his foot in it saying, right, well, we'll do this week and we'll all get dressed up as dra drag. And so he went, Lauren, you've got half an hour to do us up as a drag queen. Said, Great, right, come on, let's get on with it. And it was just, it went down a hoot. It was brilliant. Everyone thought he looked funny as out on his video call. And it, and it yeah, we had so many people laughing and it made the day of putting something so funny out there. That's awesome. And you recently launched your own merch line as well, right? Yeah. So underneath all the videos, I've got my own merchandise for Zoom Zoom, big green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes, you name it. Just different things i've got a couple of the jumpers already and whenever i go out people are like i love your jumper and um yeah it's it's doing really well it's it, it's through teespring i think a lot of the youtubers on there now have got a teespring account so yeah it's exciting that's awesome and i've heard you say that despite everything and you're, you're back the videos the views are climbing you've got your own merch line to make some money off of youtube but you don't think you'll ever make youtube your career again right I never say never, but I think years ago it was different. It was a lot easier to um, stand out, make money from YouTube. I think you've really got to be something special to get that kind of um, fame on there now where it can be like a full-time career. Uh, it's just moved on so, so much. Maybe if I learn to edit, I might be able to do it again. But I think the way I'm currently going, just letting them go live, no, I don't think so. I think it's moved on. But I'm happy with that. Do you ever reflect on everything you've accomplished? You were once considered the UK's most popular YouTuber. You just accomplished so much in such a short period of time. Do you ever take time to reflect on everything you've done? Oh, I reflect all the time. I go off in trance, you know, when I'm at work and I daydream about it all and, and what I used to do and all the the social media I used to keep on top of, all the videos, all the events, the TV appearances. I kept every single CD, every single radio show that I was on, I kept them all. I keep all the podcasts, every single Guardian column I was in, because I used to have a weekly column in that. I kept every single thing, and I've got it all in the attic in a box. And I have to be honest, when I do get it out, I do have a good cry, because I do miss those days. There's nothing you can do about it. And I think I, I kind of love the new way that it is on YouTube for me now because there's so many people who are kind of like a friend network, like I was saying. It's it's completely different now. It felt a little bit more faceless before because there's so many watching. But now I feel like I can connect with a smaller audience. We all know each other. We talk through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And it's on a personal level as well. And I feel very appreciative. And because of that, I've started doing the Facebook Lives where they can come on and see us and we can talk in real time. We do the YouTube Lives. I feel like I'm more confident and comfortable doing the YouTube and Facebook Lives than I am editing a video, to be honest, so that people can talk in real time. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned how people are commenting on your videos, like people that used to watch them way back in the day are coming back and commenting on them now. And when I was doing my research and preparation for this podcast, pretty much every single video that I clicked on that you were in, whether it be whether it be your own video or another video that featured you in it, pretty, I, there were so many comments that were talking about how you were the first beauty YouTuber that they ever watched. They kid, they they completely remember you. You were the first person they watched on YouTube, or they you inspired them to start doing makeup way back in the day. Like, how cool is that? That you were a part of such an you're such an early part of one of the most popular platforms on the internet now you pioneered an entire industry like how cool is that it's amazing i mean I, nobody else can say that can that i suppose it it just it, it it hits us it absolutely hits us and jordan will even say mom you were the first and people will say you were the first and you should be so proud of that it doesn't matter what happens 
Nobody can take that away from you. And I think that is amazing. If you could go back and talk to Lauren in 2007, what would you say? Oh, this makes us up to set this question because it's quite emotional. I would go back and I would tell her not to worry. And I would tell her to look after herself and not not be taken for granted or led astray by people who didn't have her best interests at heart. I'd tell her to really get a good management company behind her and 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 just to enjoy every minute of it and take it all in. Despite all the negative things that happened, if you were given the opportunity, would you go back just and live a regular life instead or would you still go through everything again? Oh, I'd go through everything again and some. Uh, you, nobody can take them 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 dreams away and all them experiences. I would never have had them if I'd stayed in a regular job. So you've got to take the rough with the smooth and... Yeah, I look back and I've got so much fond memories of all the lovely people I've met because of it all. So yeah, I'll I'll do it all again in a heartbeat and so I hope I get that chance again. I think you will. And I was looking at I was looking at your Facebook page and one of the interests just in like the about section of your Facebook page was your interest was making people happy because when you are happy, I'm very happy. So my question for you, Lauren, is are you happy today? Very happy. Very happy because I know I'm still making people happy. That's amazing. I love that. And before before I let you go, because I know we're getting close to the hour mark here with the 53 minutes, I want to ask you the same standard set of questions I ask everybody at the end of every interview. I used to call it rapid fire, but people said they're not really rapid fire type questions. Then I started calling it a Q&A, but then I realized this entire podcast is a Q&A, so that didn't make any sense. Um, so I don't really have a, a name for this section. But the first question is, you're going to dinner. You can take three people. It could be anybody dead or alive. Who do you take to dinner? Oh, what a question. Um, oh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, um, oh, dear. This is a terrible question. <laughs> oh, dear. How do I pick? Um, uh, Marilyn Monroe and, oh, dear. Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. Three people. Yeah. Don't ask why. <laughs> What is some of the best advice you've ever been given? Oh, comparison is a thief of joy. What is one thing about you people wouldn't expect? One thing they wouldn't expect. I've got twin sisters. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. There you go, then. <laughs> there we go. What is, what is one thing that's so important everybody needs to know? About me? What in the world? About in the world, it could be about you, it could be about anything. Like, what's something that's just so important you want to share it with everyone? Smile at people. You don't know what someone's going through that day, and a smile makes all the difference, and it releases so good, so many good feel-good chemicals. I love that. And for the final question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question. But you're not asking the question to me. Pretend you have this crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question, and you will get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you'd like to know the answer to? Did this interview go well? (laughs) This interview went amazing. I had a great time. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be on this podcast. I know you said you rushed home from work to do this, so that means the world to me. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you? Plug anything and everything you got right now. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, Panacea81 on YouTube and Facebook. And Lauren Luke Panacea 81 on Instagram. There. Yeah. Come find us. I'm I'm always doing something live or edited. Well, not edited. <laughs> if you want to hang out with coffee with a real person, come find us. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to be on this podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking the time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Lauren. Go subscribe to her YouTube channel. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. If you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at at my social life podcast or YouTube by searching up my social life. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.